Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session on Introduction to Carbon Farming. Very excited to have you all here. Uh, this is actually the second uh, virtual event we have run in our series of Future of Farming. Uh, so very excited to, to be running this. Um, the first one, of course, was on regenerative agriculture, uh, and we had so much excitement and feedback on that session that, that the uh, follow-on on carbon farming was by popular demand. So here we are. Thank you all uh, for, for joining. I see um, the attendee list is climbing uh, as we talk, which is really exciting. We're about at the 300 mark. I know we had about 1200 registered so far. Uh, so really exciting to have you all on. Um, so quickly before I get to the agenda of, of what we're gonna go through today, uh, just a bit of an introduction. My name's John Farga, one of the co-founders here uh, at AgriWeb. I am a fifth generation pastoralist myself from South Australia in the, in the Flinders Ranges, if you know where that is. Uh, very, very passionate about uh, agriculture, bringing innovation and technology to agriculture, particularly the livestock industry uh, from, from my upbringing um, and, and really being, being passionate about sustainable agriculture. Uh, and effectively, that's what this series of, of, um, of webinars and virtual events we're bringing to you is around sustainable farming. Uh, and from a personal perspective, you know, really excited to talk about carbon today. We are actually going through uh, an evaluation process on our family place uh, on, on what a carbon opportunity could look like for us. Um, we, our place is about 400,000 acres, uh, very large scale with low vegetation. So hopefully we can cover some topics um, today that will be relevant from a personal perspective, but, but also from all of our listeners and, and viewers. So really excited to talk about that. In terms of AgriWeb, for those who are not familiar with us, um, you know, and, and my personal perspective, I was always wanting to, to kind of drive innovation for livestock production, uh, drive sustainable businesses. And I guess, you know, what we do at AgriWeb is help with the fundamentals on that. It's helping with, you know, day-to-day -day record keeping, helping with the audit and compliance, both from an animal perspective and, and land management use, which is going to be a big topic of today, uh, and driving data-driven decisions, making a more profitable, efficient and sustainable business. Uh, so that's what we live and breathe. We're a software company. We have thousands of, of farmers across Australia that use our product every day. We currently ticked over about 11 million animals on our platform. Um, so, so really exciting to see the farming community uh, adopt technology, drive be best practice, uh, and also really exciting, you know, in the age we live in um, with, um, you know, with COVID, the, the digital age that we now literally have hundreds of people joining uh, you know, information sessions to learn about best practice, to learn about sustainable agriculture. So really, really exciting to see the evolution in our industry. Um, so before I uh, hand over to our guest speakers, a uh, little bit of housekeeping uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the day today. So we're gonna be here for about 90 minutes. Um, each, each speaker is gonna speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have some questions specifically for each uh, speaker in their slot. And then we're gonna leave a good 20 minutes at the end uh, to have, have some great discussion uh, around the topics that we have covered and any other topics that, that people may be interested in. So uh, in terms of um, you know, how you can be involved in the, in the Q&A, uh, you can go in and you can actually see um, there's a, there's a Q&A button. Hopefully you can see that on screen. Um, I'll just pull that up for you. So you can go in uh, and you can actually chat. Uh, you can vote for questions uh, that you want to be answered. We will then compile them uh, and make sure we do our best to answer them throughout the session. So that is how you can, uh, how you can be involved. We will be recording this session uh, and then we'll be sending it out to everyone. So you'll have that piece. Um, and we'll also send a quick survey along with that just so that we can always do a better job of bringing these sessions to you. So that is, um, that is how you can be involved in the session. Uh, and now, you know, I'd love to introduce uh, our panelists uh, for the day. So we have Lorraine Gordon, um, who's joining us. Uh, so she is a farmer in her own right. She's um, with Southern Cross University uh, and a big influencer in regenerative agriculture. And of course, was with us for our first session of this series. So excited to have uh, Lorraine back. She's gonna speak about her operation uh, and the work she's doing in, in carbon farming and, and some of the research component as well. We have Sam Trethaway, who is also part of our first session. Um, he's part of Taz Agco, 
was just telling us how cold it is down there when we, when Lorraine was boasting about her 30 degrees in Coffs Harbour. Uh, so we feel for you down there. Sam, he's obviously a, a big thought leader and innovator in the industry. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about his farming practices and, and what he's doing in the carbon world. And finally, we have Matthew Warren from, from AgriProof, um, who's doing a lot of work around, around carbon projects. Uh, and he's going to talk about the benefits um, with, with producers and the key takeaways uh, and so there's going to be a really informative session on there. So um, that is all from me from an introduction perspective. Uh, really excited to have this session. Thank you again for joining. Um, and we will hand it over now to Lorraine, who is going to kick things off for us today. Um, and I think she might have a few slides to share, but, but otherwise uh, I'll hand it over to her for an introduction uh, and to share her story with all of us. Thank you, John. Um, hello, everyone. I'll just uh, share my slides to get us started. If you can just bear with me there. Okay, how are we looking, John? Is that coming up okay for everyone? Uh, yeah, if you can just, we can see two panels. Um, so you can either try and share your entire screen if you like. Um, but otherwise we can definitely see some slides on the, uh, on the presentation. So, um, otherwise you can leave it as is Lorraine because people will see what's coming next. Yeah. Okay. No worries. That's fine. I'll just leave it in the essence of time. So, um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, just uh, to let you know, I am um, actually a, a cattle farmer. I run a, a, a cattle for, uh, fattening operation up at Ebor in northern New South Wales. I guess I consider myself um, a cattle farmer and a carbon farmer. Um, and primarily in the future, I'd like to consider myself a carbon farmer that uh, happens to use cattle uh, to achieve. Um, to achieve my goals in carbon farming. So I operate at an altitude with our farm at about 1500 metres above sea level. And in a normal year, whatever the hell that looks like, uh, that would be about 2000 millimetres of rain. Um, and we, I guess we've been offer, operating in the last few years so on less than half of that. Um, and I'm, I'm looking to do my first trade in about three years time. Uh, it is called the New England Snowies. It is red basalt country, um, high fattening country, very sought after for steer fatness. And I usually buy cattle in at around 250 kilos with the aim to turn them off in eight to 12 months, um, anywhere from 450 to 600 kilos for the um, aiming to the grass fed, MSA grass fed market. So what's been um, implemented on our farm to date, I've been in time control grazing now for um, probably around 25 years. Um, so holistic management and time control grazing. I correct mineral deficiencies in the soil based on regular soil testing. Um, I'm not a user of superphosphates or artificial fertilizers. Um, I just basically listen to what the soil's telling me and, and correct it from there on. What will I be doing in the future around um, being able to increase carbon as a carbon farming? Some of the measures that we're putting in place um, is to increase stock density. So that will basically mean either increasing our numbers um, and therefore our moves or reducing the size of our paddocks adding additional mineral um, um, applications, which will probably be in our case gypsum. Um, we've always been regular, regularly adding lime uh, because we have a very low pH. Um, but in the future, because we have never put gypsum into the system, that will be one of the methods we use to increase carbon. Um, composting, so um, at a quite a, a large scale. Uh, and uh, multi-species pasture cropping, which uh, we haven't done to date, but we will be doing to sort of um, sort the, the feed gap, I guess, in the winter months as well as using it as a tool to uh, sequester carbon. Excuse me, Lorraine, just, just quickly, um, because we can see sort of a bunch of, um, of yeah. slides and the notes on your screen. Yeah. 
If you go up to display settings, I think you might be able to, to swap that um, swap that to the big screen. Okay. I'll just pop out of it. Sorry about that, guys. No, no, no worries. So just do I just I just hit from the beginning, but uh, display settings, slideshow. I think if you go up to the display settings up the top middle there, oh, yeah. and yeah. just hit that, um, and then hit that swap, ah, that should do the trick. Is that better? Yeah, beautiful. Okay. We're on a winner. On a winner. Fantastic. Thank you. So look, just to, these are just some pretty pictures really about what we do. Um, we don't, our composting, we actually bring it in. We, um, we don't uh, compost on site like these. These pictures are not off my property. Um, but it's just some demonst a demonstration uh, of some of the um, activities that we're implementing. Um, again, this is not my property, but yes, very important tool is time control plan grazing. Some refer to it as cell grazing or holistic grazing. They're all similar, um, not exactly the same. There are subtle differences between these practices. And then of course your multi-species pasture cropping. So I just wanted to cover, because I know there's been a lot of questions around this, the various steps that are involved in carbon farming. And I just tried to put it in a really simple diagram. But, but basically, um, you need to, the first thing is to see if you're actually carbon ready and to do that initial farm assessment and appraisal. Um, so have somebody come in and actually do that for you. Um, I can talk about how you choose the right organisation to do that. But the initial step is just to have that, um, that conversation and see whether um, you know, this is actually for you. Followed very closely, hopefully, by completing a carbon management plan um, to increase your soil carbon. Then of course, you need to register the farm project with the federal government, which is quite a lengthy and involved um, process, lots of paperwork involved with that. And most people choose not to do that themselves, but to actually have um, a representative organisation do that on their behalf. And I can talk a little bit about that later and, and answer questions on that. Um, and then you can consider, and this is a really important word, consider entering into a project, um, uh, into a competitive ERF auction process for a carbon contract to sell um, ACUs or Australian Carbon Credit Union units to the federal government within within 10 years, um, you then need to complete your baseline documentation to establish the history of previous practice over the, say, the last 10 years. Um, and then the first step after that would be to base, to do your baseline soil testing, um, which also involves an audit, or an audit. And of course, the government actually requires three testing uh, regimes um, spaced apart in total over the project. And it includes mapping, recording, analysis, and record keeping. You then need to review your management plan annually, um, which is absolutely vital and important to see that you're on track. And of course, then it involves external and independent audits undertaken over these three um, testing regimes. And finally, um, there's this opportunity for the farmer to be paid within three to five years from the sale um, of their uh, ACUs to either the government or corporates, or in, in some cases, um, you may choose to sell to both. So that's just a snapshot of the process that's involved with carbon farming. Um, there are options available for, for realising value or for making money. Um, uh, registering the project, uh, that goes without saying. Um, you can register and include an ERF contract to get paid by the government um, at the government price. You can actually include a secondary market contract, uh, such as a corporate market contract, in addition to your government contract. And um, you can also sell ACUs to specific buyers and include a full history of your flora, your flora and your fauna on the farm. And that in, might include any rare and endangered species. Um, you could be certified carbon neutral. 
um, which actually is a fantastic uh, marketing opportunity and becomes more attractive to buyers, which hence you get a higher price. Um, you can actually sell products which are carbon plus uh, rather than just carbon neutral. So you're then telling the biodiversity story along with your carbon farming story, which um, again would attract a higher price. And that would include things like uh, registering for biodiversity credits and offsets. Or um, have no contracts in place at all for now and sell on the spot market um, at a period in time, um, you know, when those credits are available. And that's safe in that you don't actually, um, if you don't actually increase carbon, which will be unusual, but, you know, in, in the, the circumstance where you didn't increase carbon, then you don't actually have to deliver anything. So there's just a very, there's a number of options and people get quite confused on what's the best option and it really will depend on people's personal circumstances and what they're trying to achieve and I guess their appetite for risk. Um, I've just put up an example as I understand it of potential income from carbon farming. Um, I won't go too into this. Uh, I mean, it's just there for you to have a look at. This is based on 400 hectares. Understanding that in most cases, you won't be able to do carbon farming on your entire farm because you will have buildings and houses, you'll have dams, you'll have riparian areas, you'll have wood, woodland areas, um, tree, treed are, uh, areas that are covered in trees that you can't actually um, use. So I've just put in an example of 400, what 400 hectares of carbon farming may, may deliver in the future. So, and it depends of course on what the price for carbon is at the time. But if we looked at 400 hectares at the current price, which is um, say it's around 15 to $17 with the government, um, you know, you're looking at 843,000. In five years time, as is predicted um, at $25 an ACU, you could be looking at 1.2 million. Um, if that price is increased to uh, $30 per ACU, it could go as high as say 1.4, 1.5 million. So um, happy days, as I've said there. So, um, and they're, they're just predictions. And so this is not set in concrete, it's just to give you an example um, of how it is worked out and I guess the mathematics um, actually behind carbon farming and carbon trading. Ren, just a quick one um, and uh, I'm breaking rules of interrupting, but on that slide, um, the interest of, of that revenue, is that over a period of time or when, when would you expect that? Is that an annual revenue? Well, that's on your first trade based on 1%. Got it. You increase your carbon by 1%. Got it. Thank you. So um, I can't help but add this in. This is what won't build carbon in the soil um, and being a regenerative farmer and very much involved with regenerative agriculture, I did need to put this slide up, but uh, paddocks of bare soil and lack of ground cover won't cut it. Um, monocrops with lack of biodiversity won't cut it. Spraying out paddocks prior to sowing new pastures and crops, set stocking, overuse of synthetic chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides. And I say overuse, it doesn't mean no use, um, just bear that in mind, but it's, it's the overuse of, um, over tillage and disturbance of soil. So, and just quickly, in the essence of time, um, some of the research that's being undertaken at Southern Cross University at the moment through the Regenerative Ag Research Area in carbon farming is looking at multi-species pasture cropping as a tool to increase soil carbon um, quickly. So those very deep tap-rooted um, species and plants that can actually um, sequester carbon um, into the deep soil profiles is a means or is just another tool we have, um, but it's a it's a proving to be a very good tool. So we're sort of looking at how um, across a number of properties over a geographical area, a wide space geographical area, um, what species uh, might be best equipped to do that, what mixture of species, um, and how that can interact with grazing systems and so forth. So a lot of work 
um, some really important research work um, is about to commence in that uh, pasture cropping space. Um, comparisons between conventional and regenerative systems, um, and particularly at looking at resilience of landscapes. Um, this is very much part of my own research um, from a triple bottom line perspective. So that's looking at the social, environmental and economic outcomes of different farming systems. And uh, economic outcomes, of course, can include carbon trading and the potential for that. Um, we have some pretty interesting work going on in just the methodologies and the equipment um, to be able to measure, measure those carbon, um, actual carbon changes. So uh, we've got uh, some interesting gamma, gamma equipment, funnily enough, at the Marine Science Centre that can actually um, put a time on when that carbon is actually being produced and how old it is and um, look at all sorts of different measurements on how we can become, I guess, uh, a little bit more accurate on our carbon measurements. And so not only are we looking at the engineering equipment to be able to do that, but actually the soil te testing methodologies to be able to, to really be spot on. And once we can sort of nail these methodologies across the board, well, of course, that will bring the price of um, baseline in carbon and our carbon measurements for farmers, hopefully that will bring that, that price down. Um, look, just some, some tips from me, having um, actually walked this path and studied this path, and uh, um, I guess I'm maybe one of the earlier doctors, so I guess I'll be making all the mistakes and that will cost me. Um, but definitely, if you're going to go down this path, definitely uh, baseline where you're at. Uh, you have to do that, but register with the government. Um, if you don't do that, you might kick yourself down the track because you might actually find that you have increased your carbon and you can't do this retrospectively. So you can't then go back and claim carbon credits. So, you know, if you're serious about being a carbon farmer, but not sure whether you might trade or not trade, um, just ensure you do register with the government because then down the track you have that option on whether, you know, what, which way you may want to go. Um, carbon prices are only going in one direction and that's up. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, there are big companies out there that need to off, um, offset their footprint and uh, one of the best ways they're going to be able to do that is um, with farmers help because uh, we have a great opportunity to sequester carbon on behalf of those uh, large emitters. Um, prices at the moment are ranging anywhere from $15 up to $45 in Korea. So, you know, understand that what the government might be paying for carbon is not necessarily what the corporate world will pay. And um, in many cases, they'll pay more. Uh, so there are both government and corporate markets. And um, by t undertaking carbon farming and, go and walking down that carbon path, you know, you're using regenerative practices. So what that will also do, forgetting the carbon farming, will actually increase your triple bottom line because it will mean that you're setting your landscapes and your farms up to be more resilient in the future around climate change um, and drought, etc. So, and as I've mentioned, research is underway in the types of practice, practices that build carbon and the particular methodologies that need to be used. So John, that's, um, that's me done and I'm happy to take questions now or you'll be Brilliant. when the others have finished their presentations. Yeah, no, thank you, Lorraine, uh, for, for that um, quick and comprehensive overview. I think we can, uh, got time for a couple of questions now which are, are firing in. Uh, and we can always come back to it as well. So uh, the, the first one was around, um, you know, how we can, how, how do we actually calculate our consumption rates and, and I guess the flip side, the, the opposite of that, you know, planting trees, um, you know, the vegetation, those types of things. So how, how is that actually calculated was the question. By the boffins, <laughs> I guess. Um, I think that's probably those sort of calculations. I'm not a mathematician. I I have I actually don't know how they've come up with these calculations. Um, I have, you know, I've outlined the scenario there with the 400 hectares um, as I'm as it's been explained to me. 
Um, perhaps, I don't know, maybe that's a question for, for Matthew to be able to answer. He might have yeah. an answer for that. But yeah, the scientists have come up with these calculations. They've been accepted by the government. Um, they've been accepted internationally, which is important. Um, but yeah, that's probably a question for someone else. Yeah, no, no problem. And I think I think there's definitely some, some the art of science behind that, but we might be able to cover that in more detail with uh, with Matthew. Um, the next the next one was um, do you take carbon emissions into account when calculating carbon farming? Do you take carbon emissions into account when calculate carbon farming? Um, well, I guess, you know, this is like a supply and demand market, isn't it? So like, like I mentioned, you've got corporates, you've got airline companies, you've got mining companies out there that um, are the big emitters. Um, and let, let's, be, let's make no bones about this. Agriculture is not um, at the farm gate, I need to add, a big emitter. I mean, we, we actually only emit around 10 to 12% of greenhouse gases. Um, however, we are a big part of the solution. So um, I think by adding the story that you're um, a zero emitter or, a, a, um, or that you can completely offset your carbon footprint as a farmer is just a good story to add to the whole picture and makes your farm, I guess, more attractive to outside investors. investors. Yeah, I think that's actually a really, really important point. I mean, there's a lot of education that that probably needs to occur in the broader community around livestock emissions and the stat that's out there. If, if cattle was a country, it would be the third largest emitter and all those types of things. And it's really important to look at the actual styles of operation because when we look at an efficient grazing operations, it, it's actually a, a carbon sequester, not an emitter. Uh, and of course, when you look at other grazing, uh, other livestock production practices, then we, you know, we are in emission territory, but overall, uh, there's a big education layer that has to happen. There's a huge, and I just want to add to that because, um, you know, there's a big difference between um, time controlled, holistic grazing as against intensive livestock production. And unfortunately, the two are sort of lobbed together. There's also a big difference in the type of pasture mix that um, cattle are, are actually exposed to. So, you know, cattle are going to emit more greenhouse gases if they're living on chocolate, such as pure ryegrass paddocks, mm -hmm. than they are on a mixture of um, biodiversity in the pasture of both native pasture and improved pastures. So, you know, there's a lot more to that conversation and there's, unfortunately, the facts um, are just not getting out there. And the, then what tends to happen is that the entire market, cattle market, um, stands to lose by lack of information that goes to the consumer. 100%, and then that, that whole story gets diluted. Um, so, so one question here specifically on your operation, Lorraine, was um, you know, what size paddocks do you have? Uh, how, many, how many stock in each mob? Uh, and what's the timing of your, of your rotation? Okay, so um, we would be currently, um, and this will change as soon as our baseline's being done, but. Currently, I guess our paddocks, um, there's a fair variance in our paddocks because uh, we have some quite hilly country and then we have river flats as well. So anywhere from 20 hectares to 80 hectare paddocks. Um, our mobs would normally consist of um, around uh, 500 to 700, perhaps in a mob. Uh, they would be moved daily to every three days at a max. Um, and we'd look for having rest periods of between 45 to 60 days. Okay, great, brilliant. Thank you for that. And maybe we'll just, um, maybe we'll do one more quick one uh, and then we'll move on. Um, the question has come in saying there's a lot of information that seems to be aimed at Southern um, producers or Southern production systems. Um, is there a similar relevance and transferability to northern grazing systems and, and northern pastoral areas? Um, look, I think the principles of what we're talking about here remain the same. Um, you know, there's substantial evidence and particularly international evidence that, you know, by increasing carbon, you're increasing your water holding capacity. 
Um, and if you're increasing your water holding capacity, um, then you can bring more diversity into those landscapes. So, you know, this can apply to sandy soils, to silty soils, as well as, you know, in my case, the basalt soils. Um, it's still based on your holistic decision-making framework. It's still based on regenerative practices. I guess the only difference is um, certain climatic areas or soil types or, or landscapes are going to be able to sequester carbon more quickly than others. Mm. But all of these land, landscapes can actually build carbon. It's just a matter of how long that takes. But the principles and what we're talking about here are really, and the various tools can be applied across, across all climates, all landscapes and, and all regions. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Particularly useful from a personal perspective, but thank you. Um, so we might pause there, Lorraine, and, and I'm sure we'll circle back at the end with some questions. And I'll now uh, hand over to Sam uh, to kick off uh, his segment. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, right, where to start? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what, what we do uh, down here in Tassie, um, and I'll talk about kind of our carbon position. Um, and then I'll get into some details around carbon on farm, carbon cycle, and then we'll kind of finish up on how we manage, how we manage and influence that cycle. So um, quick snippet of background on myself. Um, grew up in Tassie, uh, although uh, from a farming family, but we weren't farming whilst I was growing up down here, but have since kind of worked uh, around Australia and overseas on a variety of different farms from northern beef and, and cotton through to um, you know, broad acre, mixed grazing, cropping, hay, all types of stuff, super fine wool. And um, so I suppose having worked on over 20, 30 farms, started to see what was done really well and perhaps what does, wasn't done so well. Um, I might also add that uh, I'm quite unique. Uh, my old man did uh, Terry McCosker's, one of Terry McCosker's first courses in about 1984, 1985. So um, for those of you that don't know, I, I recommend you go and check out um, RCS. Uh, and Lorraine's already touched on time control grazing and Terry has really been responsible for, I believe, driving the regenerative grazing movement in Australia since the early 80s. Um, and so I suppose I grew up in and around that system. So it wasn't until I went jackarooing and working on farms to see, you know, set stockers or slow rotations, I saw the impact on the environment and a bunch of other stuff, animal health, or drenching more and all these things. And I started to kind of, yeah, think that, that uh, you know, cell grazing, although you've got to do it seven days a week, wasn't, wasn't all that bad. So, um, and, and I suppose in that we've bought and sold five farms over the years and converted them and, and got them up and going and, and getting carbon back in the soil through grazing management. And I know one of the questions that came through, yes, you can sequester carbon just through grazing management, um, providing you, you, you're not doing um, some, some other things, but you can do it just through grazing. Um, yeah, we started to do that. So that's kind of, um, yeah, my, my background. And, and now we're at a point where we, we've got a thousand acres down in Tassie. We're farming around 1500 head uh, and that number should double in the next uh, 18 months. Uh, we're scaling up. We're a, a regeneratively farmed grass fed Wagyu operation. Uh, we're vertically integrated and an enormous part of what we do on a day to day basis. And from a, a future point of view for us is a disproportionate focus on sustainability and, and regeneration um, and bringing customers and end consumers along with us on that journey. Um, but more importantly, um, building data around everything that we do. Uh, as my old man uh, shakes his fist and says, this region ag stuff's great, uh, but I want to hear kilos of beef produced per hectare. And, and that's something that this space um, hasn't done well, I, I believe, is build a really robust data set to, to, to help, I suppose, convince the, the, the majority of the farmers that don't farm uh, with these methods that it is a great way um, to farm uh, and whatnot. So, so moving on um, to our carbon position. So essentially, um, uh, due to the way we've been farming for the last 70 or 80 years in, in those conventional systems, uh, that's tillage and applying synthetic furt and, and, and chemicals, we, we've basically uh, obliterated our carbon levels from our soils. Um, so although uh, as we stand, we not, may not be to Lorraine's point a huge emitter, but, but a, a significant amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has come from farming uh, practices. And of course, you know, coal and iron ore consumption um, hasn't helped as well. So we've got all this carbon up there. We need to get it back down the soil. Um, and we've got a wonderful opportunity to do that. Also wanted to get one thing straight for farmers, especially is that organic material is not carbon. 
So, so if you plough your stubble back into your soil, that's great. That, that is not carbon. Organic material is, is not carbon. Organic matter is carbon. So um, by putting organic uh, material like, like compost um, or, or, you know, as I said, stubble or, or dead growth or whatever on your soil, you, you're not introducing carbon into your carbon cycle. You're introducing uh, organic material. The way we convert that from organic material into organic matter is through microbiology. Um, and if you don't have very good microbiology, take a conventionally farmed annual cropping system, broadacre, wheat, canola, barley, triticale, whatever, um, and compare those soils to a, a uh, you know, your grandma's uh, a veggie garden out the back, um, you will see an enormous contrast between a, a rich environment full of microbiology and an enormous amount of conversion of, of organic matter into organic, sorry, organic material into organic matter versus a, 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 an almost a dead soil kind of structure um, where we are, are going to see nothing but carbon kind of emitted up into the atmosphere. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get that, that really clear. And, and just to my point, when you look at a soil test, there are three types of carbon. You've got your labile pool, your slow pool, and your inert pool. Uh, your labile pool um, is, that, is that volatile organic, mass, uh, organic material. Uh, we want to get it converted into a slow pool, um, which, is, which is what we get paid on. Um, and, and we'll get onto that in a second. Um, I suppose, therefore, that kind of leads us on to how we, how we sequester carbon and, and why we would do that and things like that. And, and um, I don't mean to sound cynical, but the modern farming system has, has pays little to no regard for carbon at all. Uh, and, and, in, and I would argue it shows no respect for carbon either. Carbon is the, is, is the foundational building block for everything. Um, if you shriveled up my body right now and got rid of all the water, um, I'd be over half carbon. You know, carbon is in everything. And, um, and, and, uh, and it seems that our modern farming system is cynical and, and anti-establishment as this may sound is if they can't sell it to you in a bag, uh, who cares? It's not something we want to talk about or take into consideration. And, and I, I really believe that. And, and so we, we start to see when you reintroduce carbon back into your, your soils and into your, your farm, we start to see amazing, amazing things happen. Um, and, and I suppose that comes into some of the ways in which we, we manage, which I'll talk about now. Um, uh, so the first piece is, and, and Lorraine's touched on it, is, is what we do is time control grazing, cell grazing, call it what you will. Essentially, you're allowing the plant and the soil uh, to rest, re-establish, get up and going again before you, you put animal pressure back on that. Um, and, and that's a, obviously a complete opposite to a set stocking operation. Um, so that's a really, really big part of, of what we do. Um, of course, it's always hard to, to get right and, and manage. And, and there's obviously ways in which you can do that and training and education, all that stuff helps. Um, the second piece that we do, um, and Lorraine mentioned, is, is multi-species. Um, and I did want to just dwell on this for a second. And, and John, you might even hold up your hand and give me a, a digit number on how many minutes I've got left, mate, so I can stay on track for a Yeah, moment. mate, another five or so, you, you've got plenty, yep. so you're right. Cool. So multi-species, the reason that this is uh, becoming incredibly sexy and, and topical and exciting and, and whatnot is... Um, essentially, uh, we're reintroducing, um, I suppose, Mother Nature's prefer preferred kind of growing environment. So if you go anywhere into the bush or, or, or native grasslands, bushlands, jungle, anywhere in the world, you'll never see Mother Nature growing a monoculture. She always grows lots of different varieties and, and she likes complexity. Um, and so we've got, um, we've been doing multi-species now for 12 months. Um, we've been introduced, we've introduced over 30 different varieties of different things into our farm. Um, and so you've got to have one of one of you've got to have one of each of the five groups. So you've got to have a brassica, a legume, a cereal, a grass and a kinopod, uh, which uh, there aren't that many of. Um, and I'll leave it up to you to find if any grow in your region. They're things like silver beet and, and a kale and other things like that. Um, and the reason that that, that, that happens is um, and you'll see Mother Nature trying to diversify herself. And, and once you start to, to kind of look at these things, you'll start to look at your farm a bit differently and you'll see her growing you know, weeds where you've got your ryegrass and clover or whatever it is that you grow. And she's trying to, there's something about that weed that she wants to, to use or grow. And, and, you know, often it's tap roots, right? We see scotch thistle and dock and, and, and other weeds like this, especially in Southeastern Australia. Um, and, and so by introducing those tap roots and different species back in, we don't only increase the carbon cycle, but we increase our soil health. And, and I'll cover on this really quickly, is we sequester carbon through introducing organic uh, uh, material, uh, which converts to organic matter uh, through microbiology. Um, and, and that's so if we, we sow, like we've sown millet and sunflowers and a bunch of different annuals, lots of um, 
Uh, yeah, brassicas with beautiful big tap roots that pull all kinds of stuff up from down low where our shallow rooted species can't get to. And that obviously being an annual, it dies. You've got organic uh, material there, which converts to organic matter and away we go. Plants also uh, put out this gray sticky substance called exudates. Uh, and that basically feeds microbiology. Uh, and in turn, the microbiology use that as energy and they then unlock and, and you know, break down other organic material and, and make things more available for the plant. So there's this beautiful symbiotic relationship between microbiology and the plant. Um, and the more plants you've got, the different types of exudates you've got. So therefore, you, you widen the, the species and types of bacteria and fungi that you've got in your soil. So you get this like snowballing effect of, of activity um, kind of above the ground and, and below the ground. So by introducing those different species, we get lots of different diversity um, on the soil, in the soil um, and, and underneath. And, and that then only translates for us, we're seeing that into animal health. So I can't feed you potatoes and sausages for the rest of your life. You'd get pretty grumpy with me. Why would you expect an animal to eat ryegrass and clover for the rest of its life and, and think that it's got a rounded, well-nutritioned diet when we know that in the wild they would forage on all different types of things? So, you know, by having all these different things above ground, we're, we're seeing our cattle, um, yeah, enjoy that salad bowl, we call it. Um, but we're also doing, uh, again, data, data, data. We're recording blood tests of animals and watching trace elements change as we introduce different types of species into their diets. So I can turn around and show you guys in a number of years this is what we've done uh, at a bunch of different levels uh, on, our, on our farm. So um, that's kind of in the last little piece, um, and Lorraine mentioned a few of them, is essentially, you've probably already worked out through my uh, presentation slash rant, uh, that um, carbon uh, sequestration and, and carbon farming, and, and of course carbon farming is basically producing and storing carbon and measuring that and getting paid on for what you put in the ground. Um, essentially it's closely linked with microbiology. So if you kill microbiology, uh, you, you, you dramatically impact the ability for you to sequester carbon. So, so by applying on heaps of, of DAP or, or N, you're gonna um, knock off microbiology and you'll effectively burn off carbon. Uh, and so you're not gonna be able to sequester carbon uh, that well. Um, if you, you know, uh, I don't care what anyone says, all, all herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, they kill good, good shit as well as the bad shit. Uh, and, and we need to stop killing stuff. Um, it's the best advice if I could leave you with anything today is just stop killing stuff. Uh, stop it and see, see what happens. Um, but that, that kills off a whole heap of stuff above ground and underground, which again impacts the ability to convert that organic material into organic matter and therefore create humus and therefore store carbon. So um, this is a real shift in thinking. Um, it's not so simple as business as usual and, and, and we can sequester carbon. Um, uh, it, there's some fundamental changes. And, and my last point is, and I agree with John, and most people, I suppose, we don't know what we don't know. And, and a lot of people think that, that they're doing the right thing. And I've worked on enough farms to know that they think that they're doing a great job at managing their land. And they think that they're leaving it for the next generation, but they're implementing a whole bunch of, of things that we're learning isn't great for the environment. And it's, it, it, it's been great for the short to medium term. And we're producing an enormous amount of food, but we're starting to see environmental health effects, human health effects, and we seem to spend an enormous amount of money on animal health chemicals and, and farm chemicals running around, pouring money on symptoms than really understanding what the core root of the problem is and, and fixing that. So um, that's my last point um, over and out from me. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and always, as always, direct to the point uh, and, and uh, no BS. I love it. Um, so, so thank you for that. And, and also, you know, dear to our heart in terms of, you know, love, love the amount of data you're collecting and capturing. Uh, and the old saying is, is make sure it's not a data graveyard and, and you're extracting that to use it to make decisions, which I know you're all about. So really exciting stuff there. A couple of quick questions, um, if we may. Uh, so the first one was around... Um, you know, in terms of the practicality of um, carbon projects on smaller farms, so less than a thousand acres, a couple of hundred cows, um, what's what's your view on on that? Yeah, um, so we baselined nearly a year ago, um, and we, we expect to baseline in, that, in another twelve to eighteen months. Um, the rain had kind of uh, also mentioned that the further you go north, and I suppose the the less active and the slower the seasons and growth with some massive generalization the 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 poorer or the slower the sequestration of carbon goes so terry mccoss will say you've got a baseline every five years kind of north of brizzy roughly and and down south we can do it every two or three years um and that's a real generalization but that's just to kind of put that out there um uh 
Matthew can answer this uh, really uh, uh, quickly uh, and, and with some figures. I think uh, down south in southeastern Australia, uh, I think you know you, you'll be in front kind of if you if you know if you base anything under forty hectares, you'd be kind of struggling to cover baselining costs and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, anything over forty hectares in in, in southeastern Australia, you, you should be able to see um, some benefits. And of course, up up north where you've got bigger, wider spaces, we've got other other issues there and costs and baselining. Um, and and I just add like. For me, this is not about uh, getting paid for carbon. <laughs> this is about farming in a way that, that's, that's you know, creating an enormous amount of amazing impact uh, on farm. You know, the quality of my produce will be far superior to the quality of other people's produce that don't employ these principles. We've already seen data come through. And so it, it's not so much about just, you know, oh, I'm only gonna do it if I get paid for carbon. It's kind of, I don't know, for me, I personally don't think that's the right way to go about it. But it, it, and it is for some, especially on, on board, big broad, broad acre scale stuff. I kind of get that. Um, but, but for me, there's a whole heap of other runoff benefits to farming like this. Yeah, great holistic uh, view and vision there, Sam. That's awesome. Um, some uh, Fiona's asked here, uh, which I think is a, a really valid one for people that are no doubt going to be inspired by you know, the work that you've done in Lorraine and, and others in the community that have kicked this off. Um, definitely takes a, you know, a, a bit to get started. So you know, what, does, what does a farmer, what does one do to start the process? Um, of actual sort of, you know, carbon farming, I guess, and then the process of, of selling carbon. Um, and I guess within that, you know, who determines the baseline um, and, you know, how does that marketplace work uh, and those types of things. Um, is, is this to me or is this to everyone? Well, this one's to you, uh, yep. Sam, but, but we can circle this back to the wider group later as well. Um, yeah. But I guess, you know, particularly on how do you get started, I think would be, yeah, sure. would be one that people would be really interested in. So it, it's really actually quite simple. So, I mean, we, we, we settled on this place in, I think, July, August. And by the time we locked and loaded everything, um, we, uh, we baseline as soon as we can. The sooner you baseline, the better, because it's only kind of up, up from there, right? So um, it's as simple um, as, as, as in, for, for me. And, and, and uh, Matthew does this for a living and has been doing this for a number of years. So he can go into detail around this. This is what he does. This is his bread and butter. It's his day in, day out. But you get someone like an agri, uh, 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 not an agri web, uh, you get someone like AgriProve um, or another carbon trader of your choice. There are a number out there and you can, you can get them on board um, and they uh, oversee and manage that, that baseline. So um, just very quickly, we had 18 cores drilled across our farm down a metre. Um, and just to, before the questions start flooding in, uh, I will not uh, exhaust or saturate my soils with carbon in my lifetime. Uh, the soil test is to a metre. So whilst we might see some really great low hanging fruit and impact in the next few years, it might only be down one or 200 mil uh, it, to get carbon down, you know, significant amounts of carbon down eight, 900 mil plus, it's gonna take a long, 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 long time. Um, so that's to quash that. Um, so yeah, basically you, you, you bring on a, a company uh, and they, they help you. Now, my understanding is, is that depending on the company, they, they do and don't do certain things. Uh, Lorraine had already indicated the, the compliance and registration process is a legislative minefield. Um, full disclosure, I, I have gone with AgriProof. Um, and the reason I have done that is my business is in farming, growing grass and growing animal protein, not in dealing with Canberra's legislative requirements and global protocols around soil carbon testing methodology. That's what Matthew does. So um, I have gone with a, a supplier, a provider, a trader uh, and a tester that has taken all of that off my plate. I literally sign a couple of contracts, see you later, we get the soils tested and I can get on with doing what my job is. So it's been pretty simple uh, and I can't speak for other carbon trading companies and I'm not here to um, promote Matthew's business, but it's been a very easy pro process for me. I just got the place baseline ASAP and I'm implementing my management processes. Yeah, thanks for covering that off, uh, Sam, because that actually got to a question that, uh, that another um, attendee grant had asked was really around how do we deal with corporates and how do we deal with all that? Um, there are services out there that can, that can assist with that. So thank you for that. And one just quick one um, was, was, you know, you mentioned a lot of um, different species there that's, that's, you know, required in order to create that holistic, uh, diverse environment. Um, what are the best types of vegetation that, you've, uh, that you have identified in, in carbon trading? Sorry, can you just ask the last part of that question again? What are the what, sorry? Best types of vegetation um, that, that you've identified that will deliver the, the biggest impact from a carbon perspective. 
what, what, so, so just to be clear, what's the best type of vegetation or the best vegetative results? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, it's actually really cool. There's some, there's some cool species out there that we've, you know, mucked around with. Like there's a, there's a species called root max ryegrass, which is an annual. It's like 70 or 80 percent of its actual volume is, it's like an iceberg is, is under the soil. And uh, it's, it's basically been designed to have this enormously massive root structure. Um, and then of course it'll die off and those roots will break down. And, and so there are lots of species out there that, that, that we can play with. There's no, well, I'm sure there's science to it. I'm not a, I don't have time to read science. I just get out there and do it and see what works and what doesn't. Um, it, there's no, uh, it's not a perfect recipe. Like mother nature isn't right. She's messy and complex and unorganized. And, and, and that's how it's the beauty of it, right? So as long as you've got one of those five families, um, you know, you will find that some grow better in your conditions than others. And you've obviously got people around you that, that can do that. Um, I, I have found just my last point on this is the, um, the, the big agricultural retailers uh, uh, don't understand this stuff. They don't understand what we're trying to achieve. They don't understand what we're trying to do. So therefore the level of advice or quality of advice that, that, that you're going to get is, is, is pretty average. So there's quite a big regenerative network. It's on WhatsApp, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, and it's some amazing farmers that produce as much, if not more produce with a third of the inputs on big scale around Australia that have been doing this. I've connected with them in New Zealand and South Africa as well. And they have been really helpful at helping me understand what will grow well, how to sow this, what doesn't work, when to do this. You know, don't, you know, we've got to crawl before we can walk. Our soils are exhausted. They've been hit with nitrogen every autumn and every spring since God was a boy for a long time, 30, 40 years. So I can't jump in the deep end and go sow certain deep rooted perennials because I really need to build up my soil condition and prime my soils with annuals. So all that stuff has come from conversations with people that have been here for eight to 10 years and are seeing it awesome results. I think you're cutting yourself short there from the, the scientist perspective. You might be call yourself a farmer, but I reckon uh, your skill there would, would, would uh, prove anyone different that uh, you have a uh, good expertise and a well-rounded knowledge. Um, so before we move on, just one really quick one that someone came in. Um, they just wanted you to repeat the five species for the multi-pasture, just really okay. quickly, um, just so that we have that. So legumes. I'm not even writing this down, whoever you are. <laughs> Legumes, uh, brassicas, uh, cereals, grass, and chinopods, which you might pronounce as chinopods. It's C H E N O P O D. They're the fifth. They're nice to have. They're not a must have. We just want diversity. But those big four are the ones up. And if you're going to put a multi species down, as long as you've got one of the five, I go for as many as I can. I've got 22, 27 mixed varieties. Obvious reasons you want at least two to four uh, legumes. They're pulling down all that nitrous oxide that we that we already put up there from our industry and and putting it into uh, plant available nitrogen in your soil. Um, so the legumes are a really big part of. Um, they've got quite acidic uh, exudates, which uh, also do other things with soil aggregation. So legumes, um, yeah, don't don't um, don't go light on the old legume. Brilliant, thank you. And I've seen the thanks come through from Lisa. So thank you, appreciate that. Uh, there you go, farmer, scientist, and well-versed in the English language as well, uh, Sam. So, uh, Thanks, brilliant. Um, look, we'll, we'll pause there and we'll switch over to, uh, to Matthew um, for, for your section. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll hand over to you. Thanks, uh, John, and thanks, uh, Agro, for this um, opportunity to present um, this afternoon at the webinar. So I'm just going to see whether I can make my uh, slide deck work. <clears throat> so I get a thumbs up if that's working now, if you can hear me. Cool. Um, uh, firstly, um, maybe just a bit of, uh, by way of uh, introduction, a bit about myself. Um, I've been working in carbon related projects for the last uh, 20 odd uh, years, everything from alternate fuels into cement kilns uh, to renewable energy technology commercialization. Uh, in 2010, I founded a, a carbon project development company called uh, Corporate uh, Carbon, uh, all focused on, on making carbon credits uh, real and being able to monetize the benefits associated with them. So back then, if we were having a discussion uh, with farmers around how do I get carbon credits, uh, the conversation went very quickly to planting trees, um, and planting trees is good, but as was pointed out to me uh, quite um, uh, eloquently, uh, as per far, uh, Sam, the uh, farmer scientist and raconteur. Uh, but if you're going to plant out uh, 
trees, where's the stock going to graze or where are we going to actually plant uh, uh, crops? And I think uh, as a carbon project developer, the great thing about the soils discussion and narrative is we're not talking about taking land out of production, we're talking about enhancing uh, the productivity of the soil uh, to improve the soil health. And so from, from that uh, perspective, uh, what we really have is a whole bunch of motivations that aren't driven necessarily by the credit, uh, the, the, the uh, soil carbon credits, the carbon credits, but they do provide a really effective and powerful uh, measurement metric in terms of how the overall health of that, that, that soil um, is, is traveling. Uh, and it's been pointed out to me uh, on, on many times, you can't actually have a regenerative farming system unless you're actually building uh, um, a soil carbon uh, levels uh, over time. So that's why we uh, at Corporate Carbon spun out AgriPro. So AgriPro is a standalone uh, carbon uh, project we call a solutions uh, provider. So our mission in life is to, to make it easy uh, to get into soil carbon projects. We wrangle uh, the forms of which there, there are plenty uh, in Canberra and then partner with those uh, innovative farmers in terms of those change practices that will deliver a, a, a result. And, you know, so look, maybe I just sort of echo that it is, is a complex field um, and you know, very, really important in terms of making decisions around who you choose to, to get advice for. So some quick questions in terms of, you know, in, in your own minds, looking at, at uh, carbon farming opportunities and, and uh, service providers is asking a range of simple questions. So really important to understand how many projects have actually registered uh, before, because it is a very complex process right from the registration how much soil carbon sampling baselining uh, have they actually uh, delivered? Uh, have they had any carbon credits uh, issued? Uh, and carbon credits are financial instruments. So when you are talking about dollars and returns, you do need to have a Australian financial uh, services license. Uh, so again, another quick check in terms of uh, the advice as to where, where it's coming from. Uh, and also we do have a, a representative body in the, in the carbon industry world, world, the carbon market industry. There's the Australian uh, Carbon Industry Code of uh, Conduct, which uh, pretty much all the reputable service providers are signatories uh, to. So you get a, just a really quick checklist in terms of establishing the bona fides of, of those uh, service providers. Um, and then maybe just in terms of at the start, so just pick up on a few of those, those questions. So in terms of, I think the question might have been talking about trees and, and how do you account for uh, carbon in trees. Uh, you can either do direct measurement or there are models, uh, full carbon accounting uh, uh, models. We can pick, pick that up um, a bit more in a bit more detail. Uh, and then also in all these projects, in every uh, project under the Emissions uh, Reduction Fund, which there's 30 odd different methods and, and approaches, um, you do have to account for not only the carbon stored, in this case, the soils, but also you account for uh, emissions uh, 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 that uh, uh, come up. Um, and we might get into a, a bit more uh, of that uh, detail um, as we go through. Just want to uh, check off on some of those uh, points. Um, I'm not going to label the points to wild, wild soil uh, carbon. Uh, Lorraine and, and Sam did a very great job at sort of highlighting those high, high points. Maybe from a perspective as to a sense of scale, here's uh, some analysis that we've uh, done. This is looking at a satellite. Uh, data in terms of those uh, land parcels identified as pasture across Australia and categorizing them by, by rainfall because you do need uh, uh, rain uh, in, in order to get those high uh, yields of, of uh, or high potential increases uh, from, from car uh, carbon. So, uh, and then we've gone through an exercise in terms of just a, a simple rainfall um, by pasture um, gradation in terms of the potential to build um, soil organic carbon. This is our internal. Uh, 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 analyses. We're just in the process of overlaying the soil carbon atlas of Australia so that we'll be able to provide uh, every, you know, anyone who's interested in running a soil carbon project a, a good indicative guide as to what the potential uh, uh, carbon yield and increase uh, might, might be. And, and so there are just, um, just in terms of by way of, of caution setting expectations, we are big believers in the ability of soils to rapidly regenerate and build uh, soil, soil carbon. Um, well, uh, the arithmetic that Lorraine uh, presented was absolutely spot on. That was describing and getting a one percentage point increase in the top 30 centimetres over a five year period, which is 25 carbon credits. Um, per hectare. So certainly none of our internal models have that level of increase. If you're able to achieve that, uh, that's brilliant. And, and one of the great advantages 
of our, our framework and measurement based framework is you capture all the full benefits. So certainly that you're not penalized in, in, you know, from, from, from that regard in terms of overachieving, but really important just to have really good expectations because if you were to achieve that one percentage point increase over 10 years, that's a fantastic result. And we'd hate for farmers to come up going like, oh, well, we, we were aiming to get there in, in, in five years and, and, and sort of being, uh, being upset on, on, on that, uh, that front. But high level, good thing about Australia, it's got a, a lot of land, 30 million hectares, which uh, on, on this uh, grazing um, uh, uh, type of land use. And even on our uh, internal analyses, we're talking you know, 140 million carbon credits uh, per year. So in terms of a, a commercial opportunity, it's, it's real. In terms of a, a climate opportunity, it's absolutely material to Australia's meeting Australia's Paris uh, targets. Um, what I'm going to do is just pick out on some of these, these uh, uh, points and how we've tried to synthesize you know, the, all those uh, quite complex um, uh, a wheel because um, there is a lot of uh, complexity. So our, uh, you know, our discussions with farmers have been sort of answering and trying to structure an approach which brings everything down to those, those uh, basic uh, steps um, to make it as, 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 as simple as, as possible. And then we wrangle all the, the complexity on, on the other side. But you do need to register the project, does need to be uh, registered. And really important, you need to do an activity that's new or materially different. And you go in and consider in terms of how that projects are, are configured. Uh, the baseline is the soil testing that's been covered. Implementing that new or materially different uh, activity. Uh, measure again. Uh, measure every uh, one, one, one to five years. Um, and uh, also just in terms of audit, you don't have to have an audit done on your initial baseline. You only get audited when you're applying for that first application of credits. And most soil carbon projects uh, in terms of the size of the scale that they're at will face three audits. Uh, over their uh, entire 25 year uh, uh, crediting period. Um, you create the credits and then there are a range of options in terms of how you, how you monetize the credits, but really important to keep the creation of credits separate to how they're actually monetized or, or uh, on, uh, on, on sold. Um, I'm just gonna pick up uh, some of the key uh, points coming through here, but these are land based projects. So in terms of going to register a project, you need the consent of all landholders to actually uh, register uh, those, those um, 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 projects. Um, how we do it uh, as AgriProve is we register the project in our name. So that at least avoids one uh, LibreArch files worth of having to be on board with the clean energy regulator, a whole bunch of police checks and, and a whole bunch of, of, of forms. Uh, so we do that all, all in our name, that streamlines the whole process and also future proofs of property too, in terms of our uh, commercial uh, structure so that if you want to change your level of intensity of, of, of activity or put the project into maintenance mode, we can uh, uh, allow that. If you think about succession planning and how you, you sell the property, restructuring, considering all those, those, those kind of options and how you uh, ensure continuity from an administrative practice uh, perspective. But most importantly, not let the rules uh, in Canberra, which there are many, dictate how, how you farm. So yeah, we. Uh, pride ourselves in, in, in having that breadth of understanding to make the forms fit, fit the farm uh, as, as opposed to coming out, well, here's all the forms, therefore, this is how you need to do uh, your farming. Um, talk to, uh, Sam talked about his sampling uh, round. This is some pictures uh, from, from, from that, that round. Um, Australia's actually got world-class, uh, world-leading uh, method and, and approach. It's, it's top uh, world's best practice in terms of the randomized approach to, to uh, sampling. Um, so we're very fortunate uh, uh, from, from that perspective. There is a level of complexity because it is all breaking the, your farm down to carbon estimation errors and, and strata uh, and then selecting ran, random um, sites with, within that. And that's because we're using that, that sampling to get an estimate of the overall soil carbon stocks uh, across, across the farm. Uh, we do the baselining. Um, one thing that we've started to, to in introduce in terms of the, the actual how you determine new or materially different, that becomes quite uh, complex, um, especially if you're you know, innovative farmers are, are, are trialing a whole bunch of new activities continuously. So that makes that new um, somewhat a, di a difficult hurdle to, to get over. So we're using quantitative satellite data based on fractional ground cover to actually set here is the baseline condition of, of the farm. And then from that, that gives us a platform to actually measure what is materially different. 
It's also a useful uh, 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 sort of reference check for uh, farms in terms of how their farm has been traveling over the last uh, 10 years and how that you know, fits with uh, their own experience of on-farm on management. Uh, and also a comparison with how that farm is, is tracking versus you know, neighbors in, in the other uh, region. So it's a very useful benchmarking approach. We do this analysis uh, on, the, on the basis of the past uh, 10, 10 years. And then from an implementation, this is you know, one, one of our projects, what we're really looking at is a shift on that baseline uh, a trend of ground cover once the start of a new practice. And we're using this to quantitatively show that there has been something materially different done on the farm in terms of its management practices at the start, start, start of the project. So on this graph, uh, this uh, bottom thick line, uh, which is bluey black, is the baseline uh, condition. So it was a declining ground cover uh, on the farm that would have continued to go down. The dotted line above it sort of shows how that trend line is adjusted, has been adjusted since the implementation of the project. So that, that shift up is saying that there's been improvement, there's been more ground cover. Um, you can't build carbon if you don't have a, a, a ground cover. So there's been that shift, so it shows that there's that material different, uh, difference. So we're looking at an evidence base to showing what's materially different on the, on the farm, uh, as opposed to relying on forms or questionnaires or, or things along those lines. And then what's fascinating is the regional average, which is that top uh, layer, that was the kind of like the regional trend line in terms of fractional ground cover. But interestingly, in this particular farm, they've increased their ground cover since the start of the project in reference to a region which was actually decreasing. So we've, again, this is really useful information in terms of the, the impact that they've had on their own farm uh, and the impact that they're having you know, in, in sort of com uh, comparison uh, with, uh, with their neighbours. Uh, this provides a you know, basis of our you know, ongoing updates every quarter. Uh, we send out our, our, our farmers an update in terms of you know, the, the data and the shift, and then we sort of use that over, over time to, to look at how the project's been implemented. And then also to pick out uh, from a predictive perspective, when's a good time to sample again, uh, because you want to be confident when you incur those uh, costs of that, that next sampling round that you actually will have a, a measured uh, increase uh, there. Um, Sam talked about forages. I love uh, mixed uh, species forages uh, as an example of how to build, build carbon because it's intuitively you can understand if you're planting over the top of pasture and getting all that root matter growing down deep into the soil, it's getting grazed off, well that's all decomposing and forming uh, soil carbon. So uh, very easy to conceptualize uh, that, that, that as a process. Again, growing more on top of, of a diverse range, better quality quantity of feed while uh, boosting soil, soil organic carbon is that space that we want to be in, which is that win-win uh, uh, proposition with the farmers that we're part, part, uh, partnering with. So uh, when we pick a time sample again, we're looking for to measure that, that increase cost of, of sampling is, is a factor. As a, a reference guide for 200 hectares, it's around about $5,000 of, of, of cost. Now your credits are calculated on the, on the change of trend line as to how that trend line of soil organic carbon is, is going uh, over time, so there's a fair amount of calculation and complexity there. It's good, keeps me in a, a, a daytime uh, job. Uh, variance is also a factor, so it's the strength of the your trend line that you can you can fit. So obviously, if you've got you know a sampling uh, a, a protocol or, or plan which has a, a lot of variance, say in terms of grouping very different soils uh, together, uh, that will impact in terms of the amount of carbon uh, that you're able to 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 measure. Um, just a few more um, uh, slides, so uh, measure, uh, and then there's another process in terms of reporting, uh, documenting all of the emissions that, that happen on the farm. In, in, you know, so so that, that broad calculation is what is the change in organic stock levels, less those uh, increase, any increase I should say in emissions. Um, it is referenced to your baseline, so if you're running 300 head of, of, of cattle, um, and you've maintained a 300 head of, of cattle, you're not having to account for all of those emissions. But if you did go up to say 500 head of cattle, it would be that increase of 200 head that would come into, into those uh, calculations. Um, and then also really important to flag and highlight that the issuance of carbon credits works as a ratchet. And by that, I mean, if there's a measured increase, the trend line goes up, uh, you get carbon credits issued. Um, now, if for whatever reason your next sampling round goes down uh, and there's no increase in carbon measured, you don't hand back credits, 
but you don't get any more credits until you're back above your high uh, sort of carbon marking in, in, in stock. Um, so it does work as a, a credit, uh, as a ratchet, so it doesn't go backwards, um, but you do have to wait till you get past that previous level. Really important though, that it's a commitment, 25 year commitment to keeping carbon stored in an agricultural landscape. So that base commitment is keeping the farm in an agricultural system. Um, uh, the, we talked about the one percentage point, 125 credits, uh, and then our, uh, our expectation in terms of good performing projects can expect around 50 uh, to $100 a hectare. And uh, the first uh, application uh, that you get for, for, for carbon credits is always uh, audited. Um, and audit, audit costs are, uh, are, are, are a factor, so it's something you also want to be thinking in about the model of engagement with your various uh, service uh, uh, providers. Um, there was a, once a, a workshop, unfortunately, run by an auditor, and the question from the floor was, well, how much does an audit cost? Uh, and the answer was, well, typically thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 know, Everyone visibly deflated because thirty dollars to $40,000 for audits going to knock out most soil carbon projects in, in Australia. So we've had to refine our, our business model. We incorporate all of that into our, our commercial offering. Uh, so that's not seen uh, by, by the farmer. We're better placed to wrangle uh, auditors and set up systems that are better, better performing. But very important, looking at these projects to go in uh, eyes wide open to look at all those various scenarios and, and uh, potential costs. Uh, this is myself uh, with the Niels and Meyer Olsen. Some of you might uh, recognize the, the soil key. So we we're really fortunate to work with Niels and Meyer on their uh, innovative technology for mixed forage species um, and getting those first carbon credits issued. Uh, that was a great learning experience from us in terms of going through that work, 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 go, and that, all, all the, the documentation, those key crunch points on, on, on audit. And you know, a fantastic result too in terms of the amount of carbon that they, they were building. So around about 10 carbon credits uh, per hectare, which puts them online for that sort of one percentage point increase over a period of, of, of 10 years. And if you've seen Niels or, or, or talked to him, just you know, a fantastic example of uh, one of Australia's innovative uh, farmers. Um, some stuff there on partnering with AgriProve, I won't uh, labour. Um, I think, uh, 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 John, we, you've got our slides. I'm happy for anyone to request them to be, um, to be um, set, set, setting them out. Um, we are continually refining our offering in terms of what we're responding to farmers are saying in terms of what if, what if, what if. So we, we think we've got a compelled, compelling offer on, 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 on that, uh, on that uh, basis. And, and we are looking at ways to demonstrate. Um, you know, so we've got a few soil key uh, demonstrators uh, around um, available to hire, you know, finding ways to, to trial new bits of equipment and new, new approaches uh, to, uh, to, to sampling. Um, just by way of winding up, we've concentrated here on soil carbon methods. There are different approaches to getting carbon credits. We did talk about trees and, and, and veg vegetation. So if you're you know, planning out some riparian zones, those, those new plantings are eligible for, for carbon credits uh, and also ways of improving uh, the efficiencies of, of digestion in cows in terms of the, you know, so uh, better, better efficiency of approaching the turn off means less overall uh, methane emissions, which can get credited. Uh, that does, that project approach has a scale issue. If you want to be looking at that as a standalone project, so you sort of need 50,000 herd plus size or better or working uh, with us in terms of aggregating up smaller uh, amounts of, of, of herds. Um, that's uh, me uh, done, uh, John, and um, thanks very much. Really happy. Uh, yeah, always love talking about the, these opportunities. Really in, always enjoy like, listening to, uh, to Sam and his on-farm you know, enthusiasm and experience and happy to, to take any questions on sort of those, those technicalities around carbon credits, monetizing them, solution. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. And definitely um, covered a lot of great content in there that people were interested in and, and a lot of questions that came in were being answered on the fly, which is which is awesome to see. Um, and I'm sure there's a there's a lot more that we can cover off. Um, so just just if we rip into a, a couple of them, um, I think there was um, a question around, you know, what's the smallest size farm uh, that, that would be worthwhile undergoing this. And I know Sam covered this a bit as well. I think it was around 40 hectare mark. Um, so it'd be great to get your insights on that. And I think um, Lorraine also has a comment on that as well. So, so um, you could get your views first, um, Matthew, and then I might, I might pass it over to Lorraine as well. 
Yeah, so 40 hectares um, is that uh, sort of cutoff point in terms of where it's uh, commercial, in terms of return of, uh, of credits. But we are working with uh, farmers who are smaller, who are motivated for, from that verification aspect. Um, so we're basically getting two or three neighbours together to make the economics of the baselining uh, work. Um, we're really motivated to, 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 to find ways to do these kind of uh, projects, uh, especially as there's a lot of interest for that, that verification. So, you know, it's independent verification of how the farm system is operating. It's actually a really good platform in terms of addressing carbon neutral claims or any really any provenance documentation because you, you've got that auditable you know, uh, bank of document, documentation. Um, so, um, but we, we make it very clear if you're below that 40 hectare mark, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, the commercial side of things is going to be quite, quite on the, on the, on yeah. and, and assuming that's also based in an area that's, that's, you know, got relevant vegetation rather than a, an arid area type of thing, so. Yeah. Lorraine, Lorraine did you have a, a point around that as well? Yes, I did. Um, uh, if you actually wanted to register in your own name, and that is not go with an aggregating company um, where, where all these properties are put together, which is the path that I've chosen to go down, um, you can do that if you have a minimum of 400 hectares, which is why I put that sample up of 400 hectares. So, you know, you can actually um, register the project completely in your own name. And I, I did want to just make a, a bit of a comment about, um, you know, how you go about choosing an aggregator or a trading company or somebody to get advice from. There's two important aspects to that. The first is whoever you choose, you're tied up with them for 25 years. So personality um, and relationships uh, have a huge role to play when you're, when you're making these sort of decisions to basically be in bed with a particular company for a very long time. So it's important that um, the long-term collaboration or partnership or whatever path you decide to go, um, you keep that in mind. Um, the other really important thing to keep in mind is there are a couple of different models out there. Um, and some organisations choose to charge very little upfront. Um, so basically, bugger all other than the, the baselining, but they will take quite a cut um, uh, at the end of the, once you start trading. So they could take 25, up to 25, 30% of your trade um, when you go to trade, compared to if you actually pay for these services up front, um, you may only be sharing 5% of that success fee when you go to trade. So you know, it's a payoff. Pay nothing now, but you do lose a percentage of your your accus and your trade uh, when you go to trade or pay up front for the services and the administration and so forth. Register in your own name, uh, pay up front, and then you get to keep more of the profits um, at the other end. Maybe I could just, just add, not to talk up our, our business model at all because it's horses for courses, uh, but maybe just some slight nuancing, uh, Lorraine, and for the benefit, uh, John, of your uh, listeners on, on the webinar, there is actually no minimum area size. If you want to register in your own name, there's no minimum area size that you need to do to register that project. You can register on any size. Sorry, it's not entirely true. The minimum is 0.2 of a hectare. You've got to, so you can't register your backyard. Um, and uh, you know, Kev can't register in Balmain Terrace. <laughs> so... That's, that's the minimum area size. You've got to think of through the, the commercialities. When it comes to selling carbon credits and getting a carbon abatement contract, there is a minimum size then. It's not area-based, although area relates to it. It's a minimum of 2,000 credits per hectare per annum is what the project has to have capacity to, to, to deliver. But then again, that's very separate activity in terms of selling carbon credits to then actually uh, uh, generating. So, yeah, sorry, uh, Lorraine, just try, try and nuancing that for, for people in terms of making those decisions about which pathway they want to go. So there's actually no minimum area size to, to Yeah, register. sorry. Yeah, you're right, Matthew. I guess that 400 hectares is where it becomes economically viable to pay up front for all of these services. I mean, you're looking at a couple of hundred thousand if you, on a 400 hectare um, area, you know, to establish a carbon farming project and, and look to be carbon trading. So 
To make that viable, you do need, I, I think you need about 400 hectares. Sure, and we're fortunate too, just to pick out the cost of baseline sampling, because the Clean Energy Regulator, who's the administrator of the, the program, has been piloting a, uh, an upfront loan to farmers uh, to be able to defray those upfront, uh, upfront costs. So you do need to have a carbon abatement contract um, so, or, or work with some, uh, someone like us. But there's now a funding mechanism to reduce those uh, up, upfront costs. Uh, mm -hmm. And the you know, feedback we get you know, some, on a number of international uh, boards, looking at new methods of development. So we are fortunate in terms of the leadership that we've got. Uh, although the forms are quite big and, and cumbersome, we are streets ahead in terms of those opportunities for farmers to access uh, payments for storing carbon in their landscape. We are light years ahead uh, uh, in, in, internationally. And now with these emerging you know, funding models and, and, and mechanism, you can uh, defray those upfront costs to make it easier to get in and, and get that all important baseline uh, done. Um, you know, I tend to agree with the, you know, Sam, you know, get baseline done because you know, from there, the only way is up. There is, Matthew, there's a bit of a sting in the tail with that one. And I must say that particular policy recommendation did actually come from the Regenerative Ag Alliance put that policy recommendation forward. The sting in the tail is, whilst the government will um, loan the money for the baselining, you have to actually sell to the government. So they're stitching up their own trading systems. So that was not what the Regenerative Ag Alliance recommended. We recommended that they should be able to sell either to the government or in the open market to the corporates as well. But unfortunately, if you do take out one of those loans, the sting in the tail is you will be forced to sell through the government, um, to the government. Some for, for that, that, just for that component of the, the, the funding, so not for the whole project. Some devil in the detail as always, um, but some good, uh, some good conversations and some good inputs there. So um, just to clarify, because this was a point that, that wanted to be answered was, um, the cost of that, that initial piece, um, we're talking, if you, were to, if you were to front load that for a 400 hectare farm, we're saying is a couple of hundred thousand, but then there's some rebates that could come into that. Um, maybe just quickly summarise that for the, for the uh, viewers would be great. Uh, can I just say, when I'm saying it's roughly a couple of hundred thousand, that's including all your, all your soil testing, your baselining, your reporting, um, your administration, your auditing costs, that's absolutely everything over that period of time. That's not an upfront cost, that's your cost over a period of time. And that's just an example. But like I said, there are other, there are, there are different ways you can go about this. You pay, you pay upfront for the various aspects of the project um, and take a bigger cut at the end. Um, and not have to share those profits, or you pay virtually nothing, and one of the mechanisms is to take the loan from the government to do your baselining. But then the downside of that is you lose more of a percentage down the track, and you may be, if you take the government loan, forced to, um, to sell back to the government, rather than in the open market, which may be worth a lot more. Sure. Uh, a rule of thumb, John, 25 bucks a hectare for a uh, cost of sampling. Uh, it does get cheaper the bigger the property you get because you get efficiencies of scale in terms of mobilisation. But that puts your 400 hectares cost of ba just the baseline sampling, uh, getting, getting, getting those results at around about eight, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000. Okay, great. That's, that's really, really useful. Um, so we've got about five minutes to go. Um, so we'll just, just whip through a few other questions we've got here. One was around, um, you know, when we're currently comparing the, the carbon credits and the pricing framework, um, I think Lorraine, you shared earlier the, the sort of potential change in prices and what we could look at in the future. Uh, how do we maximise the, the producer return when we're kind of engaging in these trades? And, and, and Matthew, this is probably something you live and breathe regularly um, because, I, you know, I understand there's a, there's a piece around um, you know, the, the credits are captured and then it sort of goes to the open market. We've got government, we've got corporates, we've got international. Um, and, ha and how does that, that framework look uh, and who takes control of all of that? So uh, maybe I'd uh, ask Sam, what was, your, what was your dad's quote again on the, on, on the data um, and, and the need for, for data? Around production. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then uh, what was it? Uh, kilos on a beef. Like, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I suppose um, 
uh, I get excited about all this stuff and, and the old man's like, you know, show me, show me it produces more kilos of beef per hectare because, you know, um, he's no fool. He's, he's 64 years old. He's seen a lot of ins and outs and ups and downs and, and new fads and crap come along uh, into, the, into the sector. Uh, and he's been watching this space for a long, long time uh, and no one has, uh, in his mind, um, up until the last few years, has been able to kind of distinctly show comparisons on, on, on at a commercial commodity point of view, returns of, of kilos of, of beef, lamb, wool, whatever you're producing per hectare using these types of practices, focusing on microbiology and carbon cycles and things like that. So that for me has been a bit of a um, s- been seared into the back of my mind. So everything that we do uh, and move forward with is around proving, proving that. And, and maybe John, uh, just the, the analogy there on the, on the carbon credit front is like in terms of where the, the, the key risks. So the trading and monetizing of carbon is the simple piece. The real question is how many carbon credits is a particular project mechanism going to deliver over a period, period of time? I mean, that becomes the real risk and unknown, which is the sort of parallel uh, with the data. Now, the great thing about the Emissions Reduction Fund platform, because because it's a measurement-based program, we're going to be throwing off wealth of data about matching farming system to what actually is delivered in terms of measured uh, carbon carbon credits. But in terms of that you know, risk, you're really looking about, well, what's your best no regrets pathway forward? Because there's so many unknowns, there's so many movable um, uh, parts in terms of that, that, that equation. Uh, and the, the best advice we give is, Try and look at those carbon credits that you're going to get and, and stream them down to a third. So, you know, have a third that you want to try and lock in a price now in terms of the forward price because I've been in markets where the things are going up, markets go up, markets go down. You know, as a carbon project developer, I love the numbers Lorraine's putting up, 45 bucks a carbon credit, bring it on. But as a, a social uh, citizen of Earth, that's a sign that we're actually not addressing you know, the fundamental challenge or climate change, uh, and which we do want to go on top of. But it's a market. market price move up price to move down. There is value in a portion locking a price in over a longer period of time. Uh, there's uh, value in keeping a portion in terms of taking a spot uh, uh, price uh, at, at the point of issuance. And there's value in, in holding because, again, you, you, know, you, you don't know. So you broadly put tranche that up into threes. You've got a really robust uh, um, strategy in terms of how you monetize uh, those, uh, the, the, those credits. Okay, yeah, that, that makes, makes a lot of sense. And I guess a follow-on uh, from that, Matthew, would be... Um, so how many how many soil carbon projects have actually resulted in in payments to producers in in Australia to date, um, and and I guess what does it look like in the in the short term, two to five years uh, yeah. from from where you sit? Um, a great question, John. That's why we put so much time, effort, and and our own uh, resources into working with uh, Niels and Maya to get those first carbon credits issued. Issued. Uh, so there's been two issuance uh, on that 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 one project, but to date they are the only carbon credits that have been been issued. Uh, in, in Australia, it's, it's actually a world first because Australia is the only jurisdiction which has got a, a national program that recognises measured build uh, increases in soil. So we're, uh, we're sort of infinitely better off than the scenario pre- previously, which was there was no carbon credits issued, uh, to now where there, there, there are some. Uh, and you know, I won't bore you with the, the sort of long, nuanced, uh, uh, detailed uh, explanation of that. But what we are seeing is huge uh, farmer uh, interest in signing up uh, with the soil carbon projects. Uh, we're working with over 165 projects uh, now. Uh, so all of those baseline activities are getting, getting ramped up. So in, to answer your question in terms of that, that sort of shorter to medium uh, uh, term, we're going to start seeing that, uh, that uh, carbon credit issuance uh, uh, register just start clocking over on a, on a regular basis. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And, and look, we're just, we're just about on time. Um, and, and one we might finish with, with Sam, um, which is one that I'd thought about as well. I'm glad someone had written in on it. Um, and it's, if we look at the dynamics of this, right, we've got if, if, people, are, if people are getting paid to, to sequester carbon, companies are out there are paying to offset it, um, you know, is, is, you know, basically big companies allowing to, to continue their emissions and they're just paying for offsets. Does it actually do anything for the environment and the planet? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, Cause I, uh, I have a problem. Uh, I actually have a problem with, with 
it's funny because I produce and, and through AgriProof sell carbon credits, but I have a problem with people buying carbon credits and, and, and offsetting their emissions and claiming that, that they're doing something for the environment. It's a bit like paying a fat kid to do the 40 hour famine for you. I've always said it, it, it you know, you're not, you're not giving up anything. You're not changing anything. You're not, it's business as usual for you. You keep eating what you eat, but you're paying someone else to do the 40 hour famine, claiming the credit and, and how cool am I? So where I think um, to answer the question, and I think we're going to increasingly see this and I'm already seeing it on social media. There's meat brands out there claiming that they're carbon neutral and they buy carbon credits. They buy carbon credits, they chuck a few solar panels on their roof and all of a sudden they're a carbon neutral beef product. I mean, it's, it's, it's smoke and mirrors, baby. So, um, so for me, we need to be showing that we're actually sequestering. And that's what we're doing. We're sequestering carbon in our soils. We've chosen to go with AgriProof for, for, for a few reasons. The biggest reason is that they're the only soil testing methodology that's been approved by the UN at the Paris Agreement. And, and for that, for us to be able to stand by, by with our brand and say that we use the world's best soil testing methodology, uh, that's 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 why we're doing uh, that's why we're doing that. Um, so we can actually claim that our carbon. We we will be tracking our emissions and we'll be managing our emissions. We've so I'm playing with my knife. Um, we've got our emissions. We're we're um, sequestering our carbon and 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 so therefore we sequester and store more carbon than than methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide that we emit. Um, just to answer your question, once I've had that little rant is, I think it's really important because it's going to put pressure on, on people to, and the consumers are already seeing it, that saying, well, you can't just buy carbon credits and say that you're carbon neutral. So there will be brands that, of course, you know, uh, including the Australian government. So we are obviously offsetting our emissions by investing and helping people um, sequester carbon and paying farmers for carbon and trees and all the other stuff that they're doing. But they know that they're also going to have to change business as usual. Uh, we're already seeing some amazing stuff happen with the investor market moving away, uh, moving funds away from coal uh, miners and, and a bunch of other stuff. So this is an, a, one of uh, many, many moving parts in a very big complex engine. Um, and we're going to see more and more businesses have to move away from business as usual, have to offset credits through buying our carbon credits, but also have to significantly change and implement and, and, and move other things around their business if they want to be taken seriously by investors and consumers because they're not stupid. Um, and and we just, we're, gonna, we're seeing more and more maturity come into this market. Look, you're, you're spot on there, Sam. We're seeing it more and more as well. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, someone mentioned earlier, it's not going away. It's going in the right direction for all of the right reasons. Um, some will be slower than others. And I guess, you know, a takeaway message here is, is you know, for anyone interested, um, there's information out there, there's resources out there, there's companies out there that can help you go on that journey. Uh, it is the right journey for sustainable agriculture uh, and the future we live in. And let's not forget Lorraine's comment that it's a marriage we're going into here for 25 years. So make sure you pick a good partner. Uh, and with that, I think we should sign off with a couple of minutes to go. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to our panelists again for a very informative session. Um, I think everyone's got a, a lot of value out of this. We will be sending the recording to everyone along with those presentations uh, from Lorraine and Matthew. Um, and we will also be providing those contact details for people that want to reach out directly and find out more. Uh, but again, thank you for joining. Uh, very excited. To, this is our, obviously our second in the series. We will be doing more. Watch this space. Uh, bye for now, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.